say our names and uh, what pronouns we use and what brought us here. I'll show you how. I'm Tia. <laughs> I use she and her pronouns and I work here at the Sustainable Economies Law Center and I work in sometimes in the Transformative Policymakers um, program which hosts these policy cafes because we think that everybody can and should make policy so we're trying to make it less um, of a a puzzle for people. Yeah. So that's why I'm here. Let's do Noni. Hi, I'm mm -hmm. Noni Session. Um, I uh, also are, I'm, I don't work for South Sustainable Economies Law Center, but Sustainable Economies Law Center is incubating our co op, which is the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Um, and we're seeking to um, stabilize um, offenders and dangerous displacement through creating network relationships and capital stack to buy new property. Mm -hmm. um, and I am here because I um, ran a, a pretty okay 2016 <laughs> city council campaign. So I'm here to talk about um, my ideas around that. <laughs> Uh, I live in the East Lake, Oakland, District 2. Um, I, my normal political space is environmental and climate justice. I've been a 25 year organizer in those spaces and um, uh, mostly around state policy. For five years I served as the um, co-chair of the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee that put together uh, our world renowned um, climate plan for the state. Um, and so, yeah, I work a lot on that policy arena, and I was asked to, to join today because um, I was part of the campaign team that helped get some of the, uh, some of the member, uh, council member Nikki Fortunato Bass um, into District 2 City Council, our most progressive <laughs> council member in Oakland and first Filipina ever on the city council. Yeah, awesome. Um, check. Uh, I'm Kyle. I see him. Um, I'm here because. Oh, yeah, I'm she, her. her. <laughs> uh, I've heard references to Nomi's campaign before, and I'm excited to be here more about it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlotte. I, uh, I work here at Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, I love Tia. Oh, That's yeah. one reason why I'm here. <laughs> I also uh, have heard so much about Nomi's campaign, and remember, that's when I first moved to Oakland, and I remember seeing. About it. And then one day she showed up in her office and I was like, oh, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious to learn more about that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hi, everyone. I'm Victoria. She, her. Uh, I'm here because I also knew about Nani's campaign when she was running. Um, and I organized with the Community Democracy Project, which is trying to pass a, a measure that would make it so that Oakland's budget would be participatory so that people could vote on it. So we're trying to actually get around city council members, but I'm very curious about how city council members um, run and are elected and how to get more progressive ones in city council. Mm -hmm. uh, hey everyone, I'm Aaron. I'm Aaron Pedrosa from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Just here uh, to talk to the Philippine American communities in the US. Mm -hmm. I am with the Philippine Movement for Climate Justice also with the human rights organizations and back in the Philippines. I'm here to listen. Huh? Him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on seat building. I am him. And I am here because uh, Self puts on the best stuff ever around <laughs> anywhere. And uh, I'm involved with EB Prec. I met Naomi at EB Prec and uh, all the Self people at all the teach-ins and the events. I've never yet attended a legal clinic and asked for legal advice or input, but I want to put my name on that list because I'm ready to have that at some point in time, whoever puts names down. Um, and uh, I work for HUD, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which you probably have heard of. And with respect to the Philippines, uh, for the first time I visited uh, Lucena City in the Quezon province for three weeks, uh, a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, because I have relatives and friends in Lucena City, Quezon province. So, glad to be here. Glad to see everybody, to meet everybody. Cool. Awesome. Everybody on this 
Oh yeah, sure. You're going back to me. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, he, him, or they, them is great. Um, I know Selk through CDP, like Victoria, and I kind of luckily walked in on this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Margie Helm from Petaluma, and I've been hearing about Selk and wanted to learn from you guys. She, her. Check the him. Um, I'm also from Petaluma, connected to her, um, and uh, we've been trying to work with progressive groups in Petaluma to encourage uh, more candidates to run, and we were thinking about putting on something similar, so I thought I'd come see how you guys do. Um, all right, well, I'll just start the step-by-step -step guide for the next, hopefully, less than 10 minutes, and then we'll go learn about Mary Rose and know you more. But for now, I'm going to do the legal stuff. Um, these are the duties of the city council. I found this, uh, our founder here at the Sustainable Economy Law Center draws a bunch of cartoons, her name is Janelle, and this was just a cartoon that I saw, but there should be seven for the city council and six. <laughs> uh, what they do is they um, vote on ordinances, they appoint board and commission members and they adopt the biannual budget which um, we'll talk about later and uh, they give general policy direction to departments so that's what they do um, or what they're supposed to do and the way to become a city council member the first thing you have to do is you have to get nomination petitions and you pick it up at city hall just down the street um, and you pay a $50 deposit uh, okay, and you also have to get something that's called a verified statement of qualification. Um, and I'll show you that later, but this is what the petition looks like. Um, the verified statement of qualification form is interesting. It asks for your name, it asks where you've lived for the past five years, your occupation for the past five years, um, what public office you've held before, and a picture, this is optional, but a picture that you've taken in the last two years that's um, four by six inches. <laughs> it goes into the um, voter booklet. Yes, exactly. But it's optional. Mm -hmm. Weird. Um, mm -hmm. Step three is you gather signatures on the form where you say your qualifications. Um, and you need, you need 20 on that form and then 50 on the petition on this form, you need 50 signatures, and that's it. And they're just, you have, they have to be from people who live in your district, and the person gathering the signatures also have to be living in that district. But um, I'm working on a ballot initiative to turn the power structure right side up by putting the people of Oakland in charge of the city budget with the Community Democracy Project, and we have to gather 40,000 signatures <laughs> to get it on the ballot. But for the city council, it seems it's simple. <laughs> just need 50. It's easy. Yeah. 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 So maybe we should just run the city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I see the motivation for this first time. We could win. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, what else is there? A, a weird rule is it says don't send more than 100 signatures. <laughs> it could be 50 to 100, but. Oh, you don't want too much. Support. They don't want too much. <laughs> you were too validated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, step four, that's it. You file your forms. Bring the petitions. And the verified statement of qualifications. And pay $250 because you already paid them $50. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
They say that's how Jean Kwan won. Yeah. She went to every door and told people, oh, don't worry about ranking me first, rank me second. Yeah. And then the incumbent didn't get enough votes. And so Jean Kwan won because she had all the, the most second rank votes. So that's not working. <laughs> but <laughs> the way it works is, ah, oh, thank goodness, because it's such an interesting video. Is that based on you or just a... I can describe what's happening. <laughs> First, they tell you to, they give you four colors on a post-it, and they tell you to rank it by putting the, your first choice on top, um, and then your second choice below that, third choice below that. Okay, so... <laughs> meeting them in person um, or calling them up. 
you should also get endorsements. And the way to do that, I just learned, is you have to fill out endorsement questionnaires, which are super, super long. long. <laughs> They're really, really long. But both Noni and Nikki got uh, many endorsements, which you'll talk about later. Um, there are money rules. Uh, let's see. In Oakland, you can adopt the voluntary expenditure ceiling, which is $1.50 per resident. Um, and if you do that, you can uh, have, if you do that, you can get um, more money from individuals, businesses, committees, other organizations, and broad-based political committees. But you just have to not spend more than that, but you can raise more money from those people. If you don't accept that spending ceiling, you can only get 200 to $400 from those. And so what's the benefit of doing one versus the other? Um, well, people like, it seems more fair when you adopt a ceiling because um, you're basically saying everybody should be able to do this. It's easier to raise a little bit of money than a lot. So you get the street cred of having a smaller budget. And the other benefit is you can apply for public funds. Um, the, there's you know, public financing for, for city council campaigns, and you can only apply if you accept the spending ceiling. What other? Uh, also, before raising any money, you have to file Form 501, which is that you just also get that from the city clerk. Um, and, oh yeah, the city funding requirements include the ceiling I just talked about. Um, and you <coughs> have had gotten the signatures, the 50 signatures, which is easy to get, and have received a certain amount of contributions already, and there are more requirements here to get see. Can I say one yeah. of the really tough catches for us is that this certain amount of money of contributions already, you have to hit a ceiling of people from California. Right, and so we got contributions from lots of places, but they didn't all come directly from District 3 residents right. in California. So we missed the city contribution by like a couple of thousand dollars. No. Mm -hmm. See, yeah, I gotta be careful about that. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the only requirements. Oh, and you should know your district, which I don't have any tips about. That's why I brought the panelists in. So, do you have any tips on how to raise money? and also knowing your district. You can start with Mary Rose. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, you're gonna start with the money question? Money first, yeah. <laughs> how did you raise enough money? How much did you raise and how? I don't even remember how much was raised, but um, Nikki declared her candidacy, I think in like September of the year before elections. So it was like 14 months beforehand because part of the, the the whole money thing is such it's like probably the most difficult thing because um, it's like you want to, to make change in, in the council and you want to win you have all these these folks who are who are wanting to make change and then it's like you you also have to have the fundraising prowess to be able to to carry out the campaign and, and the prowess comes in both in how much you raise uh, uh, and how much you raise at different benchmarks. So for instance, um, uh, the end of the year before, so like uh, if you're running in 2020, you would have to raise a certain amount by um, December of this year in order for, for um, other money interests to be able to see you as a viable candidate. Because if, if you haven't raised more or some significant amount by then, they don't see you as viable and they're not going to want to contribute to you. So then, so uh, in, in Nikki um, fundraising early, um, you basically have to get all your contacts, <laughs> ask all of them for money. So you're like fundraising from the get-go when you, when you um, file your, your form. Mm -hmm. And um, and ideally, you have a team of people who are helping you call through that list. But you're asking everybody, like at least a hundred people, probably more like two or three hundred people for money. So you need to be a social person <laughs> or individually wealthy. <laughs> 
And then so you hit different um, campaign benchmarks, and they compare you to, especially if you're um, you have you're running against an incumbent. They will compare you to your how much money you've raised to the incumbent to see if you are even a viable challenger to the incumbent. And when I say like uh, money interest, they could be like labor unions who who have money to, to pitch into candidate campaigns um, or uh, political organizations that have funds, and they'll be like, okay, are you re for real? Are you are you serious or? Um, or not, and so those are yeah. You, you meet you meet those. You have to show for yourself, and uh, you're fundraising all the time. No name. No name. <laughs> um, I'm I I have to say that we did not have the the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. So we decided to surpass money mm -hmm. um, and go a different route. Mm -hmm. um, because number one, typically I'm told that you declare at least a year before the date that the votes will be cast. Yeah. So the votes are cast November 8th, 7th, 6th, 9th. Yes. I was at that point. We declare um, July 1st. Of the, of the election year? Yes. Oh. Uh, so it was a Ooh. four to five month campaign. <laughs> um, and um, I also have shyness about calling people and asking people for things. Uh, so I know, it's because of color, right? It's yeah. like asking for yourself. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, it you have to get over that. Yeah, it was psychically challenging for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so we decided that we were going to. We tried out a couple of fundraisers who were really in it for the money and were not in it for the passion, and I made the executive decision to fire them. Mm -hmm. I didn't want them there um, because we were trying to do this for a community, mm -hmm. um, and they weren't that good, right? Maybe if they were doing it for the money and they were good at it, maybe they were good. <laughs> <laughs> so many tough choices and decisions yeah, during so the <laughs> So we decided, we did raise $10,000. Um, we got a lot of in-kind support in that um, some of the smaller news outlets, there was a real problem with the, the, the advantage we had is there, was a, there is a real problem with the incumbent. Mm -hmm. And so folks were desperate to have a viable um, um, alternative to her. Um, and so we got into kind support. So we got um, a lot of news coverage that was free. Mm -hmm. um, and we got a lot of volunteers um, that were free. And we got a lot of union labor that was free mm -hmm. um, through the endorsement process. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the money, so we, we raised $10,000. We took 10,000 votes, which is a pretty um, good ratio of a dollar a voter. Um, but we went to Oh, okay, so we circumvented some of the, the, the institutionalized needs that fundraising, um, the, the needs that press you into fundraising and going to, if you will, money interests who may not also be mission the line. Mm -hmm. So for example, and we'll talk a little bit about um, our campaign flyers, mm -hmm. to send out um, campaign flyers, not, it's not getting them made, but it's moving them through the mailing houses that's expensive. So you can run a $15,000 bill just mailing out one to two rounds of flyers. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge percentage of loss on that because when it comes in with, on this so-called schedule, these campaign fundraisers were giving us this schedule like flyers should go out on this date, flyers should go out on that date. And I started saying like, well listen, I have this recycling bin right next to my door. And when piles of things come in, I pick them up and drop them in the trash. So well, well, where's our money gonna go for that? And so I chose a different route, which is much more labor intensive. So we printed probably 20,000 flyers, which probably only cost us in total by the end of the campaign, like um, two, two to three thousand dollars. And then we physically went to every single door in our district and dropped it. But there are federal laws around delivering campaign materials by hand. You cannot place them in a mailbox. That's a violation of federal um, rules. 
So we placed them on um, <laughs> doormats. We placed them in door frames. We, we, you know, we neatly bowed them in fences, but we had to stay away from all of the federal re re receptacles yeah. <laughs> for information. Yeah. But what that meant was at the end, only having, instead of 15,000, spending 2,000, mm -hmm. and people were still saying, oh my God, I feel like we saw you guys everywhere. Mm -hmm. You reached the whole city. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I was telling one of our friends, um, my physical fitness was up to oh, its highest yeah. level. <laughs> <laughs> I walked all the stairs and knocked on all the doors and carried, you know, like me and friends of mine went out with thousands of pieces and by hand just door to door to door. So. And for folks, so you asked the district, so you're in West Oakland. I'm District 3. District 3. It's not just West Oakland. Uh -huh. So District 3 spans from the port. Uh -huh. All the way through West Oakland, mm -hmm. all the way through downtown, including City Hall, right where we are in District 3. Uh -huh. It goes all the way up the left side of the lake, mm -hmm. all the side, way right? until 580 Freeway, right? At Astro Park is where District 3 stops. Uh -huh. So it's yeah. an immense district that was redistricted around 2011 or 2013. And the, the redistricting, um, in, in many ways, dissipated the power of the black voting block in West Oakland. That is why they extended it up the lake. It changes the um, intentions of the voting block, which allows for leadership to be less accountable to those most underserved in this city. Um, yeah, because District 2 is, so then uh, District 3 and District 2 are ne next to yeah, each other. So District 2 is the, um, the east side of the lake. So Lakeshore, Grand Lake, um, East Lake, San Antonio, and Chinatown. Uh, more most of the, mo the most diverse languages spoken in um, in so yours is huge. By mm -hmm. But politically, though, mm -hmm. I found a lot of consistency, mm -hmm. and that's where we got our foothold mm -hmm. um, in terms of the vision. And politically, not in terms of the old school political vision, but a new transformation of our economy mm -hmm. um, through a different kind of political relationship, which is the cooperative relationship, mm -hmm. um, the non-competitive relationship. Um, and the removal of these hierarchical boundaries. So, mm -hmm. so where our value came in exchange for me not being able to raise a lot of money because I just couldn't cope with like spending all day calling people. Yeah. Instead of spending all day calling people, I spent all day knocking on people's doors, yeah. talking to them. Yeah. Um, and so that's how we got around it is we chose not to take some of the typical routes um, to reaching folks. Yeah. And we also had built up a lot of confidence from um, people who had some influence on others. And so uh, my, my doctoral research is in East Africa. And what they, what, what, the, what you really know about um, the liberation movements in East Africa are around um, this concept of guerrilla warfare or the headless movement. Mm -hmm. And the headless movement presumes that um, you can't destroy a movement when there is no individual personality that leads it. And so you come up with a, an initiative, an agenda, a purpose for service. And you teach that particular thing over and over again um, until everyone has the same mission and everyone leads with the same mission. So every time I talk to a person and they say, yes, I'm in, you have my vote, I'd say, your vote's great, I appreciate it, no, no doubt about that. But what I actually need from you, if you are really supporting, is I need your endorsement, your energy. Mm -hmm. So I need you to take the stack of materials or these electronic packets I've given you, mm -hmm. and I need you to give them to your mother, your cousins, your neighbors, your friends, your lovers. I need you to post and repost. Mm -hmm. Tell everybody that if they're not thinking about this kind of change, they're not thinking. Mm -hmm. So I basically had a little mini lesson. Every person I talked to, I had a little tiny like um, five minute teaching. And then I gave them an assignment. And that is why people thought they saw us everywhere, because they heard the same message everywhere. So it was a lot of consistency um, that I was trying to create through that. So I didn't have to be everywhere, but the vision was everywhere. So that's how we circumvented it. You know, like if you're shooting for the mayor's seat, there's probably some other ways to do it. Um, but I still would approach it with a similar message because the message is about personal power as opposed to institutional power. And so I felt like it was actually a really critical thing that we did not raise the $170,000 that the incumbent raised. And then only, and we only lost by 1,500 votes. So 170,000 next to 10,000 with a 10, 1,500 vote margin tells you a lot about human and people power. 
and it demonstrates to other community members the capacity we have to transform without access to capital because we're under the illusion that capital is what um, puts people in control. And so I felt like it was an important object lesson to demonstrate that it's otherwise, particularly in a city like Oakland. Because Oakland is only 400,000 400, people. That's a medium-sized city. Mm -hmm. It's not Chicago, it's not New York, it's not LA, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's my take on the money part. <laughs> money, awesome. <laughs> Um, did you find that um, events were more successful than fundraising, mm -hmm. just like phone calls or mm -hmm. door knocking? How, what was the major strategy for fundraising in Nikki's campaign? Mm. Well, well, I think, I mean, to answer that, it's like, what do you need in the campaign? I think you need the fire in the belly. Like, for pers personally, like, you need to know <laughs> what, like, so strongly why you're gonna invest all of your life and money and your family <laughs> into this campaign because it's gonna take everything out of you and it's gonna question everything <laughs> that you're about. <laughs> so fire in the belly is super important. Um, I think uh, building the team to be able to carry out that vision and, and like investing in the team so um, uh, and then uh, uh, let's see, team and, <laughs> sorry, was, um, and then there's a methodology, there's a science of actually running the campaign because the, the, the clarity and what you need to, because like some things are not common sense around running a campaign, it's like hitting certain benchmarks or the numbers game around, it's like, okay, if you can, you can tip the, the electorate this much, then it's probably, if you have, I don't know, some, like I remember like a get out the vote in the last like three days of the campaign, it was like, if we can secure something like, I don't know, 2,000 yeses, that means we probably have like 20,000 yeses. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, it's just like, yeah, so the methodology around that and like the experts around like uh, people who know those numbers are really important for the campaign. And so, I mean, all of that has some like fundraising aspect. So like, um, so I think when you're, you're passionate about why you're doing it, I think it shows through when you tell your story and when you're out there like at all the house meetings like trying to uh, raise money, people want to feel that you're like, re like, like they want to support you. And so your story and your passion like comes through there. The team, um, uh, that Nikki built, uh, so Nikki is a community organizer and so, um, so she activated all these other community organizers to be part of her team and that's who was like, that's who her campaign manager, um, her or managers, and then like the people who were organizing all of the different like get out the votes or the, um, the trainings to, to turn people out. Um, those are the people who were, so her kitchen cabinet uh, were the folks who were like uh, populating the the, um, the fundraising list and like volunteering to call different people um, while Nikki was also doing that. Like we all had our like, <laughs> our folks and then it's just like, okay, so everybody's gonna host a house party and then you have your, I don't know, I had like 100 people on my list for my house party. And like, so everybody had their, everybody on the team had their piece. And also, I think I remember door knocking and one of the things that um, was really important to me that I heard at the at door knocking was, they're like, well, she's like, one of the, the reasons why I'm gonna vote for Nikki is that I've, I've heard from so many people on her team and you're all super smart and passionate about Nikki and the issues that Nikki is about. And so I felt like her team was super strong and we, we emanated that out whenever we door, knocked on doors. And so, um, so that power came through, right? It's just like, it's like the people you train like believe in you and what your, your policies are and then they carry that out. And so like training that team um, to represent who you are is super important. And then people like are attracted to that and they want to be part of that and they support you whether with money or their vote. Um, and, then, and then I talked about the methodology, I think um, there's such a science around there, and there are people who there 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 are different experts in the electoral field that uh, that run campaigns that are typical kind of like how you run a campaign, and then there's a learning from that, and then it's just like what is applicable to a progressive candidate, a woman of color, 
that still is like values aligned with some of the methodology around that. And I think we, we picked and cho chose what was applicable um, around, uh, it's like, okay, well, you're not just talking to the people who already like your politics. It's like, how are you gonna move the middle? Um, how are you gonna move uh, how are you going to change people who are supporters of the incumbent by doing negative press on them? You know, <laughs> it's dangerous because it's just like, oh, but I don't want to like be negative, right? But then it's just like, okay, but especially some of the, the the science around incumbents is that it's hard to take them out unless people don't like them. And so, how are you going to stoke the fires around? Like, you know, you have to be a contrast to the incumbent. And so some of that contrast could be negative, or it's just like, I think one of the reasons why I really like dove into to Nikki's campaign is that, um, who's heard of the, the East 12th um, public parcel? So, um, so our neighborhood group, East Lake United for Justice, which I co-founded, um, uh, was trying to fight gentrification in the East Lake of Oakland, and we heard that there's public land that a luxury tower uh, was gonna, like hundreds of units on, um, that were gonna go up. And we're like, wait, if that's public land, why why was it such a secret deal? Yeah. And so we blew that open, we held a campaign, and the incumbent, we I worked on the incumbent's campaign um, before, like not, not during the, the, the four years before. And we're like, he's supposed to be the most progressive candidate like or person in city council. And he went against the community when we had like, it's like, don't you agree that we should build affordable housing on this public land? Um, and he just like he 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 didn't, and he totally uh, not just disappointed us, but like um, betrayed. betrayed us. And at every point, like he couldn't he couldn't stand up for he had no spine. He was always like afraid of voting against like the the conservative majority on council. And so we're like we we can't um, we we can't like possibly get this guy. Um, uh, to 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 you know serve more time like more time on council so we're like we're gonna vote this guy out and so um, and so it was also because the community was pissed off at the current um, at the current council member and we're like we have to find somebody who we know and trust who comes from the movement because just pretending you're progressive he is progressive but he did not have the relationships with groups and so. The way he ran, so also like you can't just vote in a progressive. You have to know that they are actually coalition builders, because he was not quite a coalition builder. He just had progressive things on paper, but we didn't actually know him that well. And so when it came time to like holding him accountable, he w was not to be seen. Yeah. So um, so that was also the practice. We worked to vote him out. Yes. And it's sort of off. I don't know if it's off, but this mm -hmm. concept of the progressive, mm -hmm. I think, needs to be seriously re-questioned mm -hmm. right, in our approach where we speak as progressives. If you ask anyone sitting on that day, mm -hmm. they will all <laughs> call themselves committed progressives. Uh -huh. <laughs> However, if you look at their voting record, uh -huh. if you look at their relationship to their districts, uh -huh. I um, mean, take District 7, for example. I mean, it's still... Where Reed is now? Now? You mean for 16 or 20 <laughs> years? where the, the district is completely, almost completely dispossessed and looks like a war zone, except for some of the new development that's happening up like at the edges of it, mm -hmm. and the opportunity zone that's been drawn right outside of the actual disinvested neighborhoods mm -hmm. like Brookfield. Mm -hmm. that's, is that progressive, really? So I just, sometimes I, and I know this is not technically a question, well, one of but, the questions is why did you run for a city council or why did you have someone run? So that's your answer. Yeah, yeah this, this sort of this sort of claim to be whatever a limit a, a democrat. <laughs> a liar <laughs> to our life in America. Um, <laughs> claiming to be a liberal, claiming to be a democrat, but all of the policies are more conservative neoliberal. Mm -hmm. They're more. Um, 
capitalist liberal. Mm -hmm. They're more, right? And those are, what is the depth? What are we, how are we defining mm -hmm. progress? Mm -hmm. What is the definition of progress? Mm -hmm. Who gets to be a part of that? Who gets to lead on that, right? Yeah. Who gets to define it? Yeah. And, and we have to be more specific. Yeah. We get smarter about being more specific about what we mean by progressive or yeah. radical or community-based. Right? You have to actually spell it out. Yeah. Well, speaking of messaging, what was your messaging strategy? I brought the most favorite thing of my life mm -hmm. that myself and my campaign manager, we designed this. So do you just want to hear about the messaging or the whole logic? Both, I guess, okay. yeah. Okay, so we'll go back to this front door and this recycling bin right to the right of the door, right? And you get a thousand things in every day that are the same shape and the same color and the same sets of words. <laughs> and your brain does not wake up to them. Mm -hmm. Your brain picks them up and drops them in the trash can. So for your $15,000, you get, you get 0.5 to one second of a look. However, you come home and there's this nice, sweet little piece of thing that is a different shape, a different color, and different language than you've seen through the typical sort of approach. And you're like, oh, this is different, what is this? So even if you don't care, I've already gotten five seconds from you before it's in the trash can. Um, in addition, you look at all the signs in city council and you know like a lot of the stories, some of the problems with our news outlets, a lot of the stories are like, oh, look how colorful the signs are. Red, white, and blue, yellow and blue, what are some other pretty standard ones? Just the, the colors that blend into your psyche mm -hmm. and you don't think much about it. Um, but we were really trying to appeal to the legacy Oaklander and the person who really loved Oakland, like mm -hmm. I love Oakland. So this is what you see when you come into the city of Oakland. It says like entering city of Oakland, population, district. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I want my sign to look <laughs> like somebody who's from Oakland. <laughs> Um, so they had to, they had to reel me back on the fonts. <laughs> <laughs> I like like I like jester and stuff, and they were like, no, lady, that's going too far. But <laughs> still, I know I'm still the problem when we're talking about fonts, right? We did our style guide for Evie Preck, and she was like, no. no wait, wait, uh, Nikki. One of Nikki's like draft signs had you know like the the protests like people yeah. and they're like. street sign. I went with the classic um, Oakland tree logo. Now most Oaklanders are really pissed that the city spent $300,000 changing our logo to this stupid tree that nobody wants when everyone has loved this logo for 50 years. Um, so I went with that and I did go kind of girly and a little um, informal with the heart but you know trying to tell a story without telling it. And so every time people saw it, I wanted it to feel recognizable, right? I wanted it to feel at home inside of your aesthetic vision and your, and your heart, your sense of it. And honestly, in 2019, this sign, and so we printed out, like, we did, like, um, six-foot banners, um, plastic banners, and we got lucky. We had homeowners, like one homeowner on the corner of Adeline and 16th, which is a critical intersection. They hung a six foot banner for us that was that on Adeline and 16th. And the hilarity is like right across the street there was this one house that put up like these 13 little like um, incumbent signs to try to sort of like stand next to our huge banner where people were like, oh look, someone's running for city council. So that was one messaging strategy was to tap into um, the aesthetic heart of your district, right? What is most meaningful to people? What tells them more about you than these um, stupid um, campaign colors? Um, and so they were like pushing for blue and yellow, and I was like, I don't even watch basketball. I don't want blue and yellow. Um, and also, <laughs> what are these colors? The <laughs> was uh, blue and green. Ah, yeah, blue and green. Yeah, and also green has a sort of symbolic weight to it for people in general, and even right now, because. So those were prevailing colors. So this one now had the same idea where most of the campaign flyers you get in are either a five by six or 
pretty typical. And I was like, no, even if we got to go circle, we have to do a shape that is not the typical shape. Because then when you get it in your hand before you drop it in the trash can or forget about it and fold it up and put it in your back pocket, your, your, your symbolic um, expectations are a little off. So you stop and you look at things that don't do what you expect them to do. Like a cement that's raised a little. You stop and you think about it. You remember that spot in the road. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we wanted to, I wanted this literature to do the same thing as the, the guerrilla campaign intends, that before you, if you never met me, I want you to feel like you've met me and, and gotten a feel for my passion for change, even if I'm across town like doing something else. Um, so we found some, we really worked up some texts that ask some real um, provocative and provocating questions. So if you see it says game changers versus gatekeepers. Originally we had gatekeepers at the top, but we realized that we symbolically, we, we wanted to switch that, that power um, and shift them down to the bottom, right? It becomes a secondary clause. And the primary clause is your assertion, your ask for the world and the people that you, I'm an anthropologist by training. Um, and I do bureaucracy and institutions and symbolic production through documents and conferencing and um, professional practice. So I think a lot about this. Plus, I like cartoons. <laughs> um, and so my, my campaign manager found this amazing quote that because we wanted to we wanted to go negative without going negative, yeah. right? Yeah. We wanted to it's tell the out, truth. But, yeah. We wanted to tell the truth mm -hmm. without accusation. Mm -hmm. Right? But the truth is sometimes accusation, and particularly if you guys know any of the history of our current standing incumbent for District 3. Um, so we like, do we want to name her? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all you got to do is go on your phone and ask yourself, right? Like, and the thing is, if you're in District 3 and you don't know her name, that's another indicator of the problem in So, okay? People often ask why our nation, cities, and neighborhoods experience the same problems year after year, generation after generation. And as a third generation West Oaklander, mm -hmm. the question is, why is my district still the poorest, even though we have the highest revenue of all the districts, mm -hmm. right? The answer is simple, be gatekeepers. And so you, when you're creating phrases that have lots of words, if you don't want to lose people's attention, you bold out the phrases that you want to stick. So if they just glance at it, they go, people and gatekeepers, it's done. But you already got your message across. So the gatekeepers, keepers of the status quo, are elected only to ignore the voices of those they represent. This year, you have a real choice. So we were trying to create a contrast to um, what has been the ongoing situation in District 3, because District 3 has been the, 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 the gateway to unchecked development that has spread out to the other districts and the other cities. Um, and we have not had a champion in, in that seat. Um, to do anything. So then the vote for Noni Session Oakland City Council. So we just replicated those deals. Um, we changed the vote to red just so it could that that ask uh, could stand out, that call to action. And so then everybody was sort of resisting more words on the back. But the other thing I noticed was the difference between what I wanted to do and what most of the candidates were doing was this resistance to making any state any substantial statements saying anything true that you could also be held to the fire over, saying anything radical that you weren't sure was going to market a poll well. And so in my campaign, we kind of got into a big struggle about issuing this platform because some of the more conventional folks were like, oh no, these things don't poll. Yeah. But because I... And this is when you're like question it's like the, the those who are in the know and they say oh this is not going to pull well but yeah. then it's just like oh yeah i feel it in my gut my right yeah, like, and because as i was telling my friend here i have real bad performance anxiety mm -hmm. i was just <laughs> insistent that there was no way i was going to try to get to ten thousand doors um on the basis of something i didn't fully believe in because i wouldn't i wouldn't it would the impact wouldn't land anyway right and so they kept saying no people care about jobs what they say? Jobs, policing, and housing. I'm like, okay, sure, I care about those things too, but what about them, right? I don't, I can't see spending this much of my life saying I'm gonna make jobs, policing, and housing better, right? Like, everybody says that, like, so who cares, what, so what? Um, but what I knew was important to me was transformation. And what I knew was ridiculous was sitting in city council and watching 69 people queue 
to tell the council people something really important to them. They're at the, they're at the days, they're crying, they're gnashing their teeth. City council's not looking at them. They're not giving them eye contact. When the 69 people finish crying and gnashing their teeth, then city council votes in the way that they had intended to vote before these people organized all these folks, got them out of their home after eight hours at work, got them in their t-shirts, got them lined up at the queue, got them worked up emotionally, and then our leaders just still make the choices they're going to make without um, regard to the human being sitting right there in front of you. And so what I felt was really important was to make some real radical statements about what we believe was, was implementable and immediately changeable <coughs> for our situation. Mm -hmm. so, um, so like for example, when we talked about um, creating community-based solutions to community is issues, we didn't say better, safer policing. <coughs> we said build neighborhood assemblies. Mm -hmm. that, that has a structural and, and implementable solution to why communities don't feel represented, right? Schedule D3 community access out. People in district, when I would go to people's door and tell them about this vision, they go, oh, well, who's the current council person? You don't know who the current council person is. That's her bad. That's her bad, right? So scheduling the D3 community access hours were about showing up in places of business. And so this is stacking functions. This is how you really support a district. You show up at different places of business that you know yourself need support, where city members, your, your neighbors, you are a council person, these people are your neighbors, mm -hmm. where your neighbors can find you on a regular basis and say all the things they need to say to you, whether you can do something about it or not. You cannot hide from the challenges. So what we were doing is we were using this to identify the things that we none of us should it, no longer any no longer choose to hide from. Mm -hmm. um, civic create civic education initiatives to make city hall accessible to all. Because mm -hmm. we're talking about closed door. This is why our cities have turned the way they've turned, right? Mm -hmm. And so if she wants to know about policing. So instead of making policing the headline, right? Because mm -hmm. people see those things and their hearts turn off because they felt so much pain, they felt so much disinvestment. Mm -hmm. So we were using new language, like we're using new shapes, new colors, new ways in, you have to also use new language, new ideas, new concepts. So instead of saying, you know, dealing with police, foster peaceful, empowered communities. Mm -hmm. So address the root causes of crime to decrease the need for policing, revive partnership between city hall and our youth service providers. So I was still doing field work during the campaign, and I learned that parks and recreation had in every year increasing dwindling support from our own city mm -hmm. right the year that i ran the mayor's office failed to file the paperwork for three million dollars in youth employment services mm -hmm. so that whole summer when you watch the murder and crime rate shoot up mm -hmm. and we blame it on black people and we blame it on poor people and we blame it on youth what about that one little piece of paper that was supposed to be filed mm -hmm. to employ over 300 youth mm -hmm. right um, and then strengthening citizens' police accountability measure. And that's that citizens' police commission that is still impotent until this day, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, you know, jobs. But instead I chose expand economic opportunity. And this is where the cooperative platform mm -hmm. came in. And that's the work we're still doing today here at East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative and Sustainable Economies Law Center. And then um, fight to end the housing crisis where a lot of people are like, I'm gonna end the housing crisis. But how, right? But how? So, and we started with a little intro, like, you know, my cute little smiley face or whatever. Because um, my, even my manager was like, no, don't put that picture up there. You got, you're, you're showing too much boob. And you're like, I'm like, well, I got boob. Yeah, like, hey, what am I not gonna? <laughs> so it's like, and so I wanted to give like a quick resume so people understand who they're addressing um, who's trying to talk about this? So, meet Noni Session, an anthropologist, former government liaison to the United Nations, and third generation West Oaklander. Because what they kept trying to do in the anti stories is say, activist Noni Session. Mm -hmm. Now, I, that's not a shameful term to me. I never define myself as an activist. But what you could hear was this negative resonance, like they were spinning it, like mm -hmm. activist. As if that's going to cost you money, that's going to lose you control, that's an inexperience, that's youth, that's them black people, that's them, right? So it was like this way to marginalize and um, negate 
the effort to transform the narrative and of the city. So we decided to introduce me as the professional as I as I am. Even though when you meet me, I'm just like this sort of friendly, playful person. <laughs> but like, I, there's some real things that that I have under my belt. Um, so we decided to do that. Who will find bold and creative solutions to the unique challenges of District Three? Noni believes that together we can. Um, so. This had a whole, this was supposed to really encompass the vision of the campaign and the vision for transforming the city. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of still holding today. I'm super stoked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and the one reason I've been holding on to these is because I knew that I wanted to get this message, this theoretical mm -hmm. message out, this structural transformation that you can use to really say something real to people and talk to real people outside of the these really narrow roots to political acceptance. And I will just say when we declared four months out, people were like, hey, 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 you're you're a political outsider. You've never done this before. You're gonna write against an incumbent, we'll see. And so <laughs> But you had to have the fire in your belly yeah. to know you had yeah. to do it, right? Yes, yeah. yes. But I think that it's important to teach this because everyone should be able to do it, right? Yeah. We actually had this really bomb idea for the at-large seat when it comes up, and you know, there's um, there's um, inside of districts are precincts, mm -hmm. and there are 52 precincts across Oakland, mm -hmm. and we had this bomb idea for the um, at-large race is to run 52 um, youthful, unlikely candidates that they run together as a unified slate, 52 candidates, each one builds a constituency inside of each precinct mm -hmm. where they build a communications platform, they build relationships, and they do, do teaching and teach in. Like, so the house parties are about um, activating a new political message in every single precinct. Mm -hmm. So instead of being competitive and running as this one identity, I'm going to change the world, mm -hmm. that we're activating and mobilizing large swaths of our city to know that we can actually change it ourselves. If we just wait for one person, we're going to keep waiting, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like imagine if it had been 52 of me, <laughs> right? These, this, the city council would not look the way it looks, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There would not be another developer who could come in this city without a clear and universal community benefits mm -hmm. agreement. We wouldn't have to have groups chasing local hire down one project at a time. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we, we would not be confused about what needed to be done yeah. if, that, if that city council was overrun with people who were not bought and sold into creating their own political advantage mm -hmm. as an individual. So mm -hmm. I've, I've been wanting to teach this so we can really, it can really catch fire among all of the, the weirdies, the antis, <laughs> the, right? The rebels. Yeah. <laughs> um, not the progressives, honestly. Uh, <laughs> that's why I opened it up. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, too long. Um, Mary Rose, um, share any tips on messaging if you'd like, or you could just take questions. Uh, just like a few things yeah. to, to, to add, especially as you, you were talking, like, um, even like the signs, it was like, oh yeah, we're running a grassroots campaign. Each of these like printed signs is like five, seven dollars. And it's like, how many of these can we print? Because people are like, they're like, oh, uh, we want some lawn signs to put on our, yeah. <laughs> on our yeah. yards. And it's like, oh, we only have a limit. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so, so there was that. It's just like a, like a whole like money factor, but then um, eventually is like <laughs> donations also came in and then we printed more. So it was like kind of like kind of squeezing it in. Um, but also we had volunteers who would do some clandestine midnight kind of like um, creative uh, postings of signs. So that was fun. Um, and then... <laughs> Oh, is that on camera? Oh, okay. Well, that was okay. not yeah. sanctioned by the campaign. Obviously. It was like people who were just volunteering because they were so juicy yeah. about the campaign. Right. Right. So we would see them. Yeah. We would see the signs in the morning. We were like, yeah. oh. <laughs> um, also, um, in terms of the size, I think we had palm cards that um, we were handing out to people and then we could see when they actually um, went to the website because they would they would just like scan the barcode on the, or, or the thing on the, the little um, QR code. Yeah, That's the exciting. QR code. So then it's like our, our campaign headquarters is on Grand and we would hand them out and we could see like 20, 30 people like going on to the yeah, website just from that. So I think that, that was like a, a useful yeah, our uh, thing. Our website was not that good. It could have been better. 
but it's like two years later, right? I know technology is just like <laughs> just uh, reinventing the thing. And then like what you said about like people who had um, when you had some giant signs with like your your face like blew up like fifty <laughs> times bigger. We had um, there were the crazy Nikki ladies. Um, yeah, it was part of the campaign that put giant banners in front of their houses. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then it was just like, oh my god, you're taking it to another level. But it also just like, yeah. it just elevated the, the excitement yeah. in the campaign yeah. when people were like, I'm going to put a giant yeah. banner oh, and drape it on yeah. my like, house and like yeah. everybody's going to know I'm crazy about the king. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, just, yeah. that was just fun. Yeah. That was just fun. And then it's just like, it's like, oh my god, I have to step up my, like, <laughs> my fervor. <laughs> Now that you've had experience and you have a little more confidence, if you ran a game, would you change your approach to money? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. um, I would do more house parties. Mm -hmm. um, I would do more personal appearances. Um, and I would still have the same sort of teaching method, but I would be pre-prepared with um, the packets in hand. I wouldn't do a lot of, t I would take out more steps in the lingo chain of getting people the information they needed to um, hand over. Um, and I would follow through on some of the intentions we had, but we didn't have the capacity to yeah. do so. Like um, um, having a website that really can show people where the money is coming from, mm -hmm. how it's moving, where it's going. Because what we really wanted was to bring people on the inside of the process. Um, so I think that personally, especially now that we built a reputation in the city, that that would really go over well as a way to fundraise, but still without me having to make all those phone calls <laughs> to people. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would try to raise more this time, um, and especially I would try to get deeper into those demographics that I didn't get into, because in the middle of the campaign, what I realized, dismayingly, even though having grown up here, having spent my childhood um, circulating in Chinatown, I actually have no relationship with anyone in Chinatown. I had no relationship with Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. I had no relationship with any of the members of my city besides for the black um, legacy Oaklanders and the young, um, the young sort of tech kids up Adams Point. And I was like, oh wow, you don't know as much as you thought you knew. Mm -hmm. So I would think more about um, building and healing and synthesizing those relationships much earlier on. Um, so those are the kind of things I would do differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that I would add, I think um, the, the, one of the shockers to me about running um, for office is that, uh, especially as like a, you know, coming from low income, middle income um, person, is that uh, nobody pays you to run for office. Mm -hmm. And so if you have to campaign basically full time, you have to quit your job. Mm -hmm. And so if you're if you're raising a family, <laughs> or even just for yourself or raising a family, like how are you going to um, continue to pay for your expenses while running for office? So I think that's something the movement has to do something about around um, creating funds for uh, you know low income, middle income, like social justice folks to be able to run mm. for office because um, I think what what I saw in, in this campaign is that um, yeah, it's like working full time until maybe like the spring, do, you know, cutting it to half time until like June and then like, and then, and then it's just like no income for the, <laughs> the last like I actually three or four months. I of held the my librarian job wow. while I ran. I yes. was dead. I slept Because you're months still after. working yeah. and then you're campaigning a hundred. How many hours per time? time? 20. I had a part time librarian wow. job. So wow. I would show up at the library like. <laughs> so this is why it's like, oh, this is 
why rich people can yeah, run for office. Exactly, they can exactly. self, like they don't have to worry about income. Exactly. Right. One of the things that we sort of lightly played around with before um, I ended up in the, the lap of EB Prec launching a lot of housing co-ops was me and the Green Party thought about trying to do a building acquisition <coughs> that we bought that would house candidates mm. so that they could run. Yeah. Um, but we, to pay so yeah, much rent exactly. for your because The reason um. I was able to run is because I had housing stability. Um. So I lived in the house that my parents bought when I was little. Mm. So I could have a part-time um, library job um, and mm-hmm. run because I didn't have four thousand dollar rent to pay, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, now I, they I didn't make a dime running on the campaign. Like I got some good pictures out of it or whatever, <laughs> but you know, but I, I wouldn't have been able to do it without that kind of um, yeah. generational yeah. security. Yeah. And so that's what I've been thinking about when I'm trying to find like how do you bake the perfect candidate? Yeah. One is um, um, financial flexibility, and really the real answer is housing security, mm-hmm. right? It's not even financial flexibility; it's housing security. Mm-hmm. The trouble is, if you have one location that provides the housing, they can only run in one district. Oh, indeed, indeed. Yes, yeah, so that's why this fund makes more sense, right? Like we could, you know, call it the Radical Candidates Fund. Yeah, or we can get money in that. Yeah, that yeah. we need that yeah. so that more people have access to be able to mm-hmm. finance their candidacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we're, we're building oh, Chris. Uh, you know, like I said earlier, I'm Chris, I'm part of CDP. Um, so like a young guy, 26, from Oakland, third generation as well. We lost our home, unfortunately, um, like two years ago. But like, you know, I've only been involved with CDP for a year. What would either of you suggest as your next step of like, yo, this actually seems very viable. I believe in this. Like I would want to maybe be a part of this. I feel like a speaker. I feel like a people's person. I love Oakland. I chose to come back here after, you know, boarding school and college, getting half a million dollars of education. I chose Oakland and like so what would you suggest is like the next step of actually if you really are interested where, where should you gain political experience where should you like what would you suggest are we talking about you yeah I mean me or just like put it on the video for any of the young I mean I know people like me like mm-hmm. there are plenty of us some of them you know have some other run or whatever but mm-hmm. like what do we do if we want to change this like what what should we put our foot in what should we be looking for what should we get involved with like how do we get to the next step of gaining that experience and then being like yo i am viable i've done this i've worked this i've been you know again i plan on being in oakland for the next 20 30 years hopefully yeah. if i can afford it yeah I mean, yeah don't live here now but like, you know yeah. what i mean so like what, yeah, what start, was yeah. Yeah. yeah like so um so i helped co-found east lake united for justice and we were looking at so as as lefty neighbors we're like okay how can we um, move the politics of issues that we care about and and what are the pathways to doing that and so there is elected office, which takes, uh, <laughs> while it takes less signatures, is a lot of uh, resources and, <laughs> and time and people to run a campaign. There's also, um, uh, there are boards and commissions um, for the city, the county, um, uh, state, right? And so, like, finding where, um, so like, you know, the, the, the big commissions or boards in, in Oakland are the planning commission that decides where development like where development happens or there's a budget committee if you're really into um, but and also you have to figure out okay how much political power does this body have so like our police um, over you know accountability um, like they or <laughs> this is like the city's not funding it it's just like it's hard, it doesn't have, what it's important it's important to have. But then it's just like, how do you create more viability um, and, and power for that um, for that body to make decisions? But so it's just like tracking uh, where those are, and then so um, two leadership training bodies that help you figure those out. So um, Urban Habitat runs the um, the BCLI, the Boards and Commissions Leadership Institute. So you get like a I think it's um, maybe like a six month. Uh, or four months training and they they walk you through like how governments and and boards and commissions work and then it's just like and then you get all these like networking opportunities about what openings there are in different boards and commissions Um, and you you learn as a cohort of like um, you know folks with like visionary community-based ideas Um, the uh, Oakland Rising um, 
also runs a, a leadership pipeline that was more geared towards electeds because one of the things that Oakland Rising does is like both um, propositions and measures as well as, as candidates because they have a, a C4 um, um, uh, arm. Uh, but a lot of movement people didn't want to run. Like it was so hard to convince Nikki to run, but I was one of a few people who were just like we're at like we were organizing her to run. And it's just like, yeah, how many how can we get movement people with good vision and politics and like, you know, folks who have relationships in the community to like run. And so that was like a it's it's nice to be able to go to a place where it's just like, okay, like tell me how it would it would go and to like get trained that way. So those are like some opportunities. Urban habitat and open and, uh, rising. Open rising. Mm -hmm. Did you want to advice? Mm -hmm. I kind of want to contradict it a little. Bit. Oh, sure, please. Advice is advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah please do. Um, I, I serve on most, probably more boards right now than I should. Mm -hmm. um, and even with the reputation we built, I experienced limited ability to impact mm -hmm. and create change through these boards. So yes, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm serving because people have asked me to do so because mm -hmm. um, they want my voice there, mm -hmm. not because I'm enjoying it at all, <laughs> or because I'm seeing really um, ability to create impactful movement on them. I'm trying, mm -hmm. but you know, you've been on boards mm -hmm. prior to running. Um, I wouldn't have even been able to get on any of those boards mm -hmm. because many of them are appointed mm -hmm. um, and by the mayor, yeah, and or, yeah. or another council person, mm -hmm. or because you're a friend already there. Um, and I feel like most of my learning came on the job. So the key word I want to give you, especially young people and people um, like you, like that 52 that I still want, is the concept of this is what you want to think about when you wake up every day: parallel power. You create power for yourself. I do not believe that it is any longer the time to go to established power centers and ask them for power. Mm -hmm. They won't give it, nor do they really have anything to give, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, because we're so bought out um, by um, corporate and market interests. Mm -hmm. And so really where we got the momentum for the campaign, where we got a lot of the learning from the campaign, where we got a lot of the legitimacy and the support is from the parallel power organizations that we formed prior to the campaign without any designs on those seats per se. And so I was telling my friend over here from Petaluma before people got here, um, when I was, I use the royal we often, but there is an actual we behind some of the decisions we made. Um, and he asked about that. And I was one of the co-founders of a people's assembly called Sobo State of Black Oakland, which was a response from the Malcolm X grassroots movement to start people's assembly so there would be a voice for black Oaklanders as these transformations happened in our urban city. So we organized over 500 black Oaklanders around um, deciding what our intentions are for this city. And that, and before that, I did a couple of small organizing before I realized I was an organizer, just with a um, um, Bay Bayer Organization of Black Businesses when it was still Cowrie Village. And we held um, barter events where we were trying to create trust networks among black openers to trade goods and services among themselves. And then the second group I organized with was Afrocentric Oakland, which recognized that as black openers were being pushed out and as usual in Oakland, Black people using space in itself was a political act. Mm -hmm. We organized events where black people would use space just to be alive and be happy. Like mm -hmm. being black happiness is a political act, yes. unfortunately, yes. in 2019. Mm -hmm. And so those efforts to create parallel power, where we're not asking these power centers to validate our presence, our intention, our vision, places like CDP really activated me. They're Do you want to say what CDP is? Because you said you joined a year ago? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the Community Democracy Project, if anyone doesn't know, we are trying to flip the power structure upside down, or uh, right side up, excuse me, um, and give back the people the powers that we equally share the say on what we do with our city budget in Oakland. Um, and again, I joined as a volunteer, like literally got pulled in by a neighbor when I was back on the neighborhood that I grew up in, and uh, was just like, oh, there's a police brutality conversation going on. And I walked in and they were having, again, this really good panel, people really sharing like how it affects everyone, not just, you know, I mean, again, I loved hearing 
not only how black people obviously are affected by it, but how other people are intimidated and fear how this relationship is being built and how we have to survive through how our protection and service treats us. So, um, I mean, again, and then hearing what our mission was as far as trying to get the power back because, you know, Libby just raised the budget for the police. You know, they're doing, you know, training schools. So it was like, but we don't have, you know, agencies for helping people who are homeless that are better, like more in depth ones. And so th that's exactly what I mean, right? Right. Parallel power, meaning that you build power for others. Yeah. And when you build power for others, you build a base, right? So I'd say, for example, somebody I feel like I could run right on the spot is Nita B from the village. Because mm -hmm. Nita B has devoted a big chunk of her life and her livelihood to building power for others, mm -hmm. right? So she walks through the door with a legitimacy that can't be undercut by people who have power, have an interest in guarding the doors to power, mm -hmm. right? So that's what I mean by us being in a 400,000 person city. You can get to every door in this city. Amen. You don't need the consent of City Hall to build power in this city. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's my recommendation. All right. Well, the way these policy cafes work, are, um, after the teaching, you get to, if you want to run for city council, you get to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Is, does anyone here want to run for city council? Or you like soon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely do. <laughs> uh, Chris, stay. Uh, and talk. Anyone else? That's perfect. You got two people to talk to. Thank you guys. Thank you so much.